And I am uh, starting a new series uh, this weekend. And for many of you, the three weeks that we're getting ready to spend in the series are going to be something where we're going to talk about some subjects, honestly, that are some taboo subjects that we avoid in the church quite often. Well, we don't do a very good job of talking about these subjects over the decades, really, and millennial is that the subjects of anxiety and depression, the subject of alcohol, the subject of racism. Like, we have plenty to say about these subjects. Don't get me wrong. We all talk about them plenty. We just don't talk about them in church and as a church. And we thought we should take some of these taboo subjects and really take a chance. So let's see what God has to say about them. Because let's just be honest, who cares what you got to say about them? Let's find out what God has to say about these subjects. So we're going to do that. And this week, I want to talk about anxiety, anxiety, stress, panic, fear, uh, anxiety. Somewhere between 20 to 25% of every person in this room that I'm speaking to right now is taking some form of anti-anxiety or anti-depression medicine, and the experts will tell us that only about 50% of those who need to get help of some kind are actually talking to a professional and getting help, so it probably should be much higher than even the 20 to 25%. In fact, anxiety, panic, and depression really is the plague of our modern age. We're seeing it rise more and more. It's affecting more and more people. In fact, maybe you've been there before. Maybe it's affected you. Your heart starts to race. You're worrying about something, thinking about something, or maybe it just hits you from out of nowhere. You start to feel like you can't even breathe, right? I mean, your palms are sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy. You're nervous, but on the surface you look calm and ready to you guys know where I'm throwing and flowing. I make a joke because, honestly, it's not a joke. If you've been there before, you know that it is no joke at all. And if you've been through it, it's awful. It's awful. In fact, my journey with anxiety began about five years ago. Now, I didn't know that it was anxiety five years ago when it first happened, but when it happened five years ago, we tried to diagnose all kinds of different things of what had happened, and finally we thought maybe it was a blood pressure, or a blood, uh, uh, anyway, insulin issue, whatever that's called. Five years passed, and honestly, nothing, nothing really happened. Nothing really happened, and so five years passes, and then six weeks ago, I'm preaching at the 8.30 service, and all of a sudden, it's starting to happen again. I, I can't, feel like I can't get a good breath. And I'm, I'm preaching, and, and, and all of a sudden, I feel like I can't get any breath. I'm, I'm going to just stop breathing is what my mind started saying. And now, all, a lot of you have a fear of public speaking. I have no fear of public speaking. I love to get up in front of you. Since I was a little kid, all I've ever wanted to do is get on the stage. I love it. And all of a sudden, all I want to do is get off of the stage because what I'm thinking is I'm going to fall out right here in front of everybody. And I know my friends. It's going to be on YouTube if I do it. But I'm starting to get nervous, and so I try, to, try, I try to make a joke. I say something about being old and that I need to catch my breath, and then I go and get my composure, just a little bit of composure. And by the way, I am old um, because this week I went and got new glasses, and they told me I had to get put in these transitions glasses that are become reading glasses at the bottom. And so the only reason I can see, only time I can see people that are close by is to do like this right now. So now I understand why old people are like, hey, Sonny, what are you doing? Because they're just trying to. They're just trying to see. can't see anything. These glasses on. But all of a sudden, I try to get my composure together, and, and I, I finish preaching the sermon. And then um, the next two sermons were awful. I, I go straight to the doctor afterwards because I'm trying to figure out what in the world is going on. And they start to try and help me talk through some stuff and figure out what's going on and running some tests and different things. And the rest of that weekend, but also the next week or two is just was quite frankly just awful. This is awful. Every time I would walk up to someone or someone would walk up to me to talk, it would start again. I feel like I couldn't catch my breath. I feel like that I'd been running the marathon. If I went to a small group of people, it would start again. My kids would come to talk to me, it would start again. If Connie wanted to have a conversation, it would start again. In fact, at the July 
um, newcomers, which we do every single month just to kind of introduce people to our church, it was a smaller crowd than normal because um, it was July 4th weekend. And so it was so small, we said, hey, let's just sit around a table and we'll just talk together. And during this conversation around the table, I had no less than three panic attacks, anxiety attacks. In fact, at one point, I looked at Connie, and I was like, hey, why don't you help me a little bit with this? And she kind of took over newcomers just for a minute because I felt like I couldn't catch my breath. It was, it was awful. And here's the deal. People, like preaching to them, meeting with them, talking to them, carrying on normal conversations with my, with my wife and my kids, that's like what I do. Like my contribution to the world is husband, Dad, pastor. That's all I do. And all of those involve at some point being able to talk to people. And so this weekend, I am no expert by any case. You, you probably need to get more advice from a doctor. You probably need to talk to a counselor if you're going through some of these things. I'm no expert, but I have an experience. And over the last six weeks, I believe that searching Scripture reading some books, talking to some experts, going to counseling, just kind of finding out everything I could about this. I believe I've got something for a lot of you, the 30% or so that I believe are probably suffering from this on a daily basis for some of you that will really help you today. Now, there are several stories in the Bible, and I want to use uh, those stories as a backdrop because that's what I do. I go to the Bible first, and I know that Bible sometimes confirms what psychologists and scientists are saying, but I want to see what the Bible has to say. And so as I've studied this, there seems to be two different types of anxiety. And there seems to be like, you, you can, now if you talk to psychologists, if you read white papers on it, if you study on it, you know there is a multitude. There's a rubric of all kinds of different types of anxiety and panic and all these disorders and everything. But I'm talking about if you take it all the way up, there basically seems to be two types of anxiety and panic that we suffer from. And the first is physiological. It's physiological. Now, if you've heard me preach before much, you know that just like God, who is three persons, we are three parts as well. We are body, soul, and spirit. We have a body. We know that. We have a soul. That's our intellect, our thinking. And we have a spirit. That's our connection to God. And there is a part of anxiety that is physiological. It's, it comes from the body. It comes from the body. We see this in our first story in 1 Kings um, chapter 19. 1 through 18, but we got to go back to 1 Kings 18 just for a minute to understand what's going on. In this story is this prophet named Elijah, and Elijah has just won what was the battle of the century, probably one of the biggest battles of all time. And you may remember it. He's against the prophets of Baal. It's the prophets of Baal, all of them, the false god against Elijah, one prophet, and God. And they wet down this wood, and Elijah, or the Baal prophets, try to call down some fire, and Elijah talks smack to him in the Bible, which you got to love the Bible, because he really is. He's talking smack. He's like, hey, where's your God at? Maybe he's sleeping. And then he actually says in the Bible, he says, hey, where's your God at? Maybe he's using the bathroom. Maybe that's where he is, because it was we, he didn't show up. And then Elijah calls down fire, and it explodes, and he is on top of the world. And now there's been a drought in the land, which was a drought that was promised by God because of Ahab, the wicked king, walking away from God. And Elijah is feeling so good about himself. He's like, you know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to make it rain. I'm going to make it rain. And that's what he does. He goes and he prays to God and he makes it rain. And so now he's in front of Ahab, the king, and he's in front of his chariot. And the Bible paints this picture, which I love because when I play basketball, I like nothing more than to talk smack. And so I see Elijah talking smack and then he dunks on him when he brings the rain. And then he gets in front of the chariots and it says that Elijah is like in front of the chariots like, I mean, he's just, he's just, he is full of himself, just full of himself. He's had a good day, right? A good day. And then we get to verse, or chapter 19. When Ahab, the king, got home, he told Jezebel. Now, the Bible says Ahab was mean, and it says, but his wife was meaner. Like, she was the meanest woman who's ever walked. So when you tell your wife she's got a Jezebel spirit, just expect to be slapped in Berkeley County, because that's what's going to happen. All right, so... When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything about Elijah that he had done, including the way he had killed the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow 
I have not killed you just as you killed them. And listen to what Elijah, Elijah was afraid, he was afraid, and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed, listen, that he might die. He just strutted in front of the chariots, and hours later, he's praying that he might die. He says, I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. I've had enough, and I'm a dead man walking. I mean, I've already died, God, because she's after me. I'm already dead. Why don't you just go ahead and kill me, God, if this is how it's going to be? Now, if you, like me, are one of the 300 or more here this weekend who have had what experts have called the dark passenger of anxiety or depression on your journey in life. It's traveled with you in your journey in life. You understand what Elijah is talking about. You understand feeling like there's just no way I can make it another day. You understand being so afraid, so fearful, sometimes of things you can't even put your finger on what they are. But you're so afraid, you're so panicked inside that you, you just feel like, God, why don't you just take me? You know what it feels like to think for your family. I wish I would just die because I caused my family so much stress and so much anxiety. We can't even go somewhere and they don't know if I'm going to freak out or I can't even have a normal conversation and all of a sudden I'm, I'm getting all angst up. And you're tired of it and you're weary of it and Elijah finds himself there. But what I want to say to you as your church what I want to say to you as your pastor, and let me just say that many churches and many pastors have done a disservice to those of us who deal with anxiety and depression and, and panic by saying, just pray more. Just trust God more. I mean, it's all in your head anyway. Just suck it up, buttercup. Get over it. You maybe have been told that before. I want to tell you as we sit here and read Elijah's story, I understand what he was going through. I desire to be on the stage. I want to be here preaching to you. And during that moment, all I wanted to do was run away as fast as I could. And many of you have experienced so much more than what I've experienced. And so I just want to tell you, you're not alone. I know that you think you're alone. I know that you hide in the bathroom at work hoping no one ever sees you having the panic attack. I know that you, you're in your cubicle and you're shaking and sometimes you feel like you can't even control your hands and they curl in on you. I know that you've been in, the, in Walmart and you had to tuck yourself away in a corner because you couldn't handle it anymore. I know for some of you, you walk into our church and the crowds and the noise and everything just sends you into this anxiety overload. And I want you to know, you're not alone. You're not alone. We're here for you. We're walking through you. And I think we've got something here in Scripture that's going to help you. See, there, there are just times, though, we're talking about physiological things that happen. When God calls us to go through a stretching time, maybe it's just stretching our faith to quite a bit. Maybe God's just calling us to do, that. that work is just going to be hard for a season. It's a pedal to the metal season in life, maybe. And you just go, it's just a lot of stuff coming at us. And this brings on stress. And what stress is, is these times, it is a great amount of adrenaline is shot into our body. And adrenaline, our adrenal glands are right up here, it's shot into our body to cause that fight or flight syndrome to happen. And so when something is chasing you or after you, it gives you that extra burst of adrenaline so that you can actually run fast when you know you can't really. You've heard about people picking up cars to get them off of people. There's adrenaline that happens. But what happens is, is when we're in an overstressed time, we've been on a high, man. We've defeated the prophets of Baal. Rain has come. We've run in front of the chariots. Everything's good. But then fear comes in our life. There's so much anxiety and there's so much adrenaline in our bodies that overstress begins to happen. And overstress makes people feel terrible. It's terrible. In fact, there is a whole effort that happens. It's a flush of the adrenaline that happens after you get overstressed. It feels a lot like depression. I know for me, we had 2,481 people here on Easter Sunday. It was incredible. We had four services. I was preaching my heart out like I try to do every single weekend. It was an incredible time. And can I tell you, the Monday after Easter, I wanted to quit. I did. I, wanted, I was like... You know, no one's going to come back next week. Like, why would they come back? 
No, nobody even likes this place. Like, why did we even build it? I mean, I'm just talking crazy talk. I feel terrible. I feel terrible. And so people ask me all the time. They said, I can't believe that your day off isn't Monday. And I tell them, I say, why in the world would I waste my day off on the day I feel the worst? I want to be at work on that day. And so, I mean, I'm feeling terrible after. It was overstress, overstress in our lives. And look at Elijah. You see this. He's tired. He's depressed. He's worn out, and he finds himself in an anxiety attack, sitting under a tree, feeling all alone. And you've been there before. Maybe for you it's your couch. Maybe for you it is tucking away in the bathroom at work. Maybe for you it's that place you go in your house where nobody knows you go there, and you just kind of get it under control. He's under a tree, and he feels alone. But I love what happens next because it shows us practically in verse 5 what to do. Look, it says, then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. First he sleeps, then he eats. We underestimate the power of proper sleep and diet. Do do you know that just a hundred years ago, this this statistic blew me away this week, a hundred years ago, only a hundred years ago, The average American got nine to nine and a half hours of sleep every single night. They didn't have no Netflix to binge on. They didn't have no lights. They already made nine babies. They're going to bed. They're going to sleep. That's what they went to sleep. They got nine to nine and a half hours of sleep. Do you know that consistently across the board, scientists on all kind of different sides of the aisle and different values on different kind of things, that they all agree that the human body needs seven and a half to eight hours of sleep, or nine hours of sleep, rather, to even be healthy. Like, seven and a half is like the bare minimum. They actually say, too, that young adults and teens need up to 10 hours a day of sleep. So teenagers in the house, when you sleep till 1 p.m. on Saturday, tell your parents, I'm just catching up. Like, I got to catch up. I need 10 hours of sleep a night. Babies and young children need 11 to 14 hours of sleep. And what we see with young babies is they don't, they don't know how to do that. we got to help them learn how to do that because why? We are disobedient from the very time that we are born. God shows us, tells us that we need this in our life. It's what our bodies crave, and yet we are ignoring it completely. The average American right now is surviving, and I won't say thriving because most of us aren't thriving. We are surviving on less than six hours of sleep a night. It's below six now. And the scary part is, in the last 15 years, it dropped a full hour, the average did. We're sleeping less and less and less. And it's causing disease. It's causing stress. It's causing irritableness. And ultimately, it's causing death in our lives. And we underestimate the overstressed world that we live in. Look at what God said. Psalm 46, 10, he says, be still. Now, that's followed by, and know that I am God. But he first says, be still. In other words, the very first thing that God needed to teach us was that we need to be still. We need rest. He said, when you get rest, you'll get clarity of mind. You'll know that I'm God. When you get rest, you'll understand why what you're going through is going to be used by God and how to get his power. When you get rest, you won't talk to your spouse that way. When you get rest, you won't be overwhelmed and overstressed by everything that comes into your life. And in my experience over the last several weeks, I've learned is that this fast-paced, adrenalized, overstressed culture that we live in is killing us And we have to decide as the people of God, are we going to be set apart? Are we going to be different? Are we going to acknowledge that God made our bodies and that he knows best? And he said, take a full day every single week and just rest. He said, take a little bit of time every single day and just rest, to meditate, to pray, to be still. And Elijah just gets some sleep, gets some sleep. We're allowing our pride. Pride is, some of you, I I don't need that much sleep. Everybody else in the, in the world is weak sauce. I survive on four hours of sleep a night. And if I could talk to your spouse, they would say, and they're grumpy, and they fall asleep when I talk to them at night on the couch, and they're mean to people at work, and they have no patience for the kids. Oh, I can do it. I get so much done. I, I wake up at 4.30 every morning and work out and do all this stuff. And, and, but um, now, now I do have to have 18 bottles or jugs of caffeine to be able to do that. And, and I do have to do that. So I'm, so I'm stimulating. So we use fake sleep 
to stimulate our bodies, which also causes adrenaline to rush out of our bodies, which is killing us. It's killing us. Marriages are failing, falling apart because there's no compassion or kindness. So some of you think, I don't know how my grandmother put up with my grandfather. She was always so nice to him. Or my great-grandmother, and she just was so nice to him. You know why? Because she got a nap. That's why. She had some compassion to put up with his fool self because she had got some good sleep the night before. And you want, I'm so stressed out. You're like, they had nine kids. How do they have nine kids? My two are stressing me out because their kids slept. And they slept. And now we have a lot of kids walking around who are wired up too. I saw somebody the other day. If this is you, I apologize. You can email me and complain about it at I don't care at freedomchurch.sc. I saw somebody the other day who had a picture of a child drinking Mountain Dew. And I was like, I know I'm jacked up on Mountain Dew, but at least I'm a 43-year-old grown man. I'm a grown Christian man is what I am. And so, but don't let your babies be all jacked up. They're out of sleep. And we wonder, why are they so irritable? I'll tell you why they're irritable. They need a nap. Why is your boss a jerk? He needs a nap. Next time your boss is a jerk, just go, hey, darling, I think you need a nap. That's what I think you need. Would you go in your office? We know you don't do anything anyway. Just go in there. Take a nap. Take a nap. That's what you need. We need a nap. I was looking when I was going through all of this a few weeks ago at a spreadsheet that I keep of all my sermons. This is sermon number 293 for me at Freedom Church in six years. Most of them, that is pretty cool. Most of them I've preached two or three times. Well, all of them I've preached two times. Most of them I've preached at least three times. Many of them I've preached four times. And I was thinking, I was looking at it, over 900 sermons I've preached. Now, now why do I tell you this? Because I was reading some research um, that public speaking, so a lot of you do this in your jobs. And, and let me tell you this, this is interesting. The highest um, form of anxiety, the highest statistic for anxiety are in professionals. It's in CEOs, VPs, uh, managers of people. It's in the professional class because they, they, do a, they have an overstressed life. They speak to a lot of people, and they don't get a chance to do anything but use their mind. They don't use their bodies enough to get adrenaline out, and so they're overstressed. And what I was seeing is, is that the research says that public speaking, so leading that meeting at work, talking in front of that group for that team project at work, um, talking in front of people like I do um, for 30 minutes or more, is the equivalent on the adrenal and nervous system of an eight-hour work day. So in other words, you could go out and work hard, dig ditches, do all that for eight hours, and the same amount of adrenaline and stress is put on your body during 30 minutes of, of, of public speaking. And, and, and the reason I was reading through that article is because something intrigued me, is it said 25% of pastors report dealing with depression on a regular basis. And then this one got me. And 70% of them deal with anxiety and panic attacks. 70% of pastors report dealing on a regular basis with over-adrenalized, over-saturated body that doesn't know what to do with all the adrenaline. And so as I'm reading all this, I'm thinking, okay, i got to tag this the right way then because it's physiological. It's physiological. And so I've gone after some physiological things. They may not be things for you, but they're, they're just some practical handles to put on it. Number one is I'm exercising daily. I used to not exercise at all. The greatest exercise I had was to get up off the couch to go get me another Diet Mountain Dew and something to eat at night. That was the extent of all of my exercise. So now I'm, I exercise them. I'm also eating better, trying to just eat a little better. Connie's always made healthy food in the homes. I always cheat. All right, so that's kind of how that goes. Here's the other one. This one's big. You'll know that Jesus moved and God showed up because I'm not drinking any caffeine anymore. None at all. Hadn't had caffeine. I haven't had caffeine in f- over four weeks. No Diet Mountain Dews. Praise God for uh, whatever that stevia or whatever that stuff is called that I'm drinking. All right. Um, meditation and breathing. I've added that to my nighttime routine. I'm not watching TV all the way up to when I go to bed. I lay in bed and I do some some breathing techniques. I tried to teach my wife and my daughter this, and they laughed hysterically at me, so they don't get no breathing techniques anymore. I'm not teaching them anything. They only own. <laughs> but I was doing some breathing techniques. I'm doing some meditation. God tells us, be still, and, and he says, this is what you got to do. And what I found is many times, oh, and then here's the other one. This is the taboo part. This is the taboo part. I want to I speak honestly and frankly about this. Um, I'm also on some medicine on some medicine. So they put me on two types of medicine. One is a long-lasting medicine they put me on. Basically tells my brain, you know, you think you need, you think you're being chased by a saber-toothed lion. You're not. You don't need adrenaline. Like just, that's what you think's going on. You're okay. 
you're not going to get killed. All right. And then the other thing is, is right before I come to preach, or in the morning, before I come to preach, I, uh, I take a beta blocker is what it's called, and it slows my heartbeat down. Now, I take one, not two, because I don't want to stop it. All right. So that's important. <laughs> Just because it works don't mean it works better if you take two. All right. So that's not how that works. So, so I, I got some medicine. And this has been the taboo thing in our culture and in the church is, oh, well, if you got to be on medicine, you must not trust God enough. Well, if you've got to be on medicine, then you must, you must not really, really have faith. You just need to pray over it. Well, I prayed over it a lot, and I still couldn't breathe. And something was, go- because something was going on physiological. All right, the second kind. Second kind. Second story. David, King David. Most of David's psalms show us this picture in Scripture of this man who was anxious. He's very anxious. He had seasons of panic and hiding. Much like Elijah who ran away and hid, David had times of hiding in caves. He, he had a lot of seasons of hiding from people. He had seasons of panicking over enemies who didn't even exist yet. Sometimes enemies who did exist. So a lot of panic. And he was definitely depressed at times. Look at Psalm 38. 6 and 8, it says, I am troubled, David said. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. His soul is in turmoil. He's depressed. His soul is there. And David shows us a second type of anxiety and depression that comes, and that is psychological. So we have physiological. There are some things happening in our bodies that are causing this to happen over over generalization, but then there's psychological. That's the soul. The soul is made up of the mind, our intellect, our thoughts. We're trying to remember. And many have called depression the dark night of the soul. Psychological anxiety it seems to be, as I've been reading, really influenced by two streams. There are two streams that come into our brains, and those two streams will make us have the psychological anxiety that we tend to have. Now, the first one, are, they are wiring and worry. Wiring and worry. Now, now, the first one is wiring. We'll look at that one. We now know that because we can study the brain so closely... We can see things happening in the brain these days that, that actually just confirm Scripture. Like the, the part where it says retrain your mind in Scripture, re- remap your mind. We now know that positive thoughts can retrain your mind. It literally gets new grooves into your, your brain. And so we know that's true. Capturing your thoughts. We know that there is a place where thoughts come from in your brain. There's a seed of where they are. And if you can capture that, even imagining that it's there, we now know that you can retrain your brain to get that out of your thought process. It's amazing how science just confirms Scripture. But in this, we also are able to see that there are chemical imbalances sometimes in the brain that the chemicals, the natural tranquilizers and the neuroceptors in the brain are off balance just a little bit. And because they're off balance, it causes some people to be in this state of panic and anxiety. The saber-toothed lion is out to get me all the time. So, so they wake up that way, they go to bed that way, it's their, it's their norm, it's their, it's, their, it's their bottom floor of where they are. And then everything else, all the stress that comes in, just pushes them over in that. And here's what needs to happen in this situation. If that's you, every single day, all the time, I want to encourage you, put across, step across the taboo line to go see a doctor. I want to encourage you to see a counselor, to talk through what's going on. They can help identify, is this from wiring? Is this, why is this happening in your life? What could we do to treat it? Would, would just counseling help with that? Are there some triggers in your life that you can identify? And I would like you to do that. But what I want to make sure we don't do, because the church has been very guilty of this, pastors have been very guilty of this, it is no more sin to take medicine for an imbalance in your mind than it would be to look at a diabetic and say, why are you taking that insulin? Don't you you trust God because insulin is a chemical. That's right. <laughs> insulin is a chemical in the body that the pancreas doesn't make enough of it, just like there's some neuroceptors and natural tranquilizers that aren't made enough of in the brain. And because of this, we say take, un- take synthetic insulin, take medicinal insulin, and there are medicinal tranquilizers and there are medicinal uh, uh, neuroceptors that help you to deal with the imbalance that is there in your mind. So I want to plead with you. I want to beg with you. Your church is here for you. Your pastor supports you. Please go talk to someone and get help. I have several different friends who deal with this. One of them is a counselor and who has given me 
Just incredible insight. In fact, after I preached at 8.30, I went and grabbed her and said, hey, give me some feedback. And she said, you didn't say anything psychologically heretical, so you're good to go. So that was great. And she's given me so much understanding. Uh, Another is your worship pastor, Pastor Cody, who has talked openly and publicly about a lifelong struggle struggle with psychologically induced um, depression, anxiety, and panic since he was just a child. And he's talked openly about that. In fact, we're going to put that sermon up again this week on Facebook so you can listen to it again, where he just shared about his journey and what's going on in his life. And I would encourage you to check that out. And uh, that's one of the streams. It comes from wiring. The second stream is of anxiety, of this psychological anxiety, is it comes from worry. Everyone I've talked to has said, regardless of whether it's physiological anxiety whether it's psychologically induced by wiring or whether they don't know what it is. Everybody I've talked to has said that worry and overthinking, regardless of the imbalance, is a major trigger for them. And let me just preach just a little bit here. The Bible teaches us that worry is sin. It's sin. You can't read the Bible and come away going, but it's all right for me to worry because God just, he knows what's going on in my life. No, it is sin every single time. In fact, for me, the sin trap that I fell into is that I have this anxiety attack caused by a physiological problem, but all of a sudden it gets into my psychology. In other words, I start to think, overthink, overstress. All I'm worried about is whether I'm going to have another attack about. And before long, I'm having anxiety attacks because I'm stressed out about the fact that I might have an anxiety attack. Now, that's a cycle when you get into it, and that's what was happening, but it was sin. It was sin because the Bible tells us, Philippians 4, 6, be anxious. Another word in some translations there is don't worry for anything, for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety, your worries on him because he cares for you. He can take it. You can't worry. The overanalyzation of thoughts and possibilities is a sin. Here's what it really is, is it's a lack of trust in God. And so whether it is a physiological problem, whether it is a psychological problem, or whether you have no idea, you combine worry, lack of sleep, a bad diet, and a lot of stress in your life, and you will be a disaster, an absolute disaster. And and here's the revelation I hope you can get. Here's what I hope you walk out of here hearing someone who honestly has been pretty prideful about this until it happened to me, is I hope you can hear me say, you're not as strong as you think you are. You're just not. You can't continue to sleep that little and live a good life. I mean, you can survive, but nobody wants to be around you. Everybody just thinks you're just a cranky mess. You don't do things well because you're never really thinking clearly. You're always forgetting stuff. You're always snapping on the kids. You're always fussing at your, uh, your wife, spouse. So you're not doing it well. You can't keep on working at this pace. You can't. you got to slow down. We are, because of medicine and science, now living longer than anybody ever has because we've got the ability now to treat things that we couldn't treat before, and yet people are still dying early deaths from stress, heart attacks, strokes at young age, from stress, from not sleeping enough, from carrying a weight that they cannot carry. Here's the deal. You're not God. You need a God, but you're not one. And when we trust him, what we say is, I can't carry all this stuff. I got to get some sleep. I can't keep working at night because I got to get some sleep because I can't do this without sleeping right, without exercising, without all these things. I can't be the best version of myself, which is what God wants for me unless I obey God. So what do we do when we're freaking out? Because that's really the question, right? What, what do we do? The disciples figured this out in Matthew 14, 22 through 26. It says, the disciples were in trouble, far away from the land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. At about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. Everybody say terrified. In their fear, everybody say fear. They cried out. It's a ghost. Terrified. Fear. Panic. I can imagine. Now listen, they had just come off a big high. They had just fed 5,000 men and women and children, more than 5,000. They just fed them on one little boy's, you know, Captain D's little lunch. They just fed them all. 
And then all of a sudden, they are strutting, and they get in the boat, and they're going out, and a storm comes. So they are they're in this place of fear and panic. Stress was heavy. Worry, sinful worry was there. Anxiety was present. But Jesus, the next verse says, can I tell you that no matter the source, whether it's physiological, whether it's psychological because of wiring, whether it's psychological because of worry, no matter the source of your anxiety, but Jesus, Jesus is the resource that can help you get through it, no matter what, but Jesus shows up, and he spoke to them at once, and he said, listen, don't be afraid. Well, how not, Jesus? How can I not be afraid? You don't understand what I'm worried about. You don't understand the storms that are all around me. You don't understand that every time I think about it, my heart starts to race. How can I not be worried? He says, don't be afraid. And then he tells them how. He says, take courage. Take courage. See, I think that there's somebody here who's waiting for someone to encourage you. You're waiting for someone to come and give you something that'll help you better. You're waiting for, you're just sitting there going, maybe this will change in my life sometime. But God brought me here today to tell some of you it's time for you to take what is yours. Because God said, you're the head, not the tail. You're the, you are on top, not on the bottom. And Jesus says, you're my disciples. We just fed 10,000 10, people, more than 10,000. You can do this. I want you to take courage. Take what's yours. I wonder if there's somebody here who's been so meekly walking through life that you believe you don't deserve any better, that you believe your life can't get any better, that you believe this is just a stress load that you'll always have to carry. And what God wanted you to come here today is to say, I want you to take what's yours because you're a son and a daughter of the Most High King, and we take what is ours. I want you to take courage. I want you to walk right into the storm, and I want you to believe that no matter what, I am here for you when you're curled up in a fetal position and panicked. I'm with you when the storm is lapping over the boat of your life. I am with you because I want you to take it. Somebody say, I'm taking it. I'm taking it. I'm taking it. I'm taking back my courage. I'm taking back my strength. I'm taking back God's wisdom that he's given me. I don't have to walk behind devil anymore. He's not in charge of me. I'm going where I want to go. Take courage. That ramp up probably didn't help my adrenaline, but I can't help it. Take it. He says that. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, who would it be, Peter, walking on the water? If it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. I want you to see this. This was so encouraging to me. Some of the greatest advice that I got from my friend Mandy was she said, hey, be careful. Don't walk away from your trigger moment. Don't walk away from what stresses you out. Don't walk away from it, but walk right into it. And she said, take a step. And look what Jesus calls him to do. He says, come right into the storm. He doesn't calm the waves. He doesn't calm the storm. He doesn't make the boat stop shaking. He says, Peter, come on out. Come right in. And Peter takes steps right out into the storm. He takes steps right into his greatest fear. I know that for some of you, taking a step to go, I'm going to make a daughter's appointment, is going to be your biggest fear. Some of it to just to talk to somebody about it. So many people have told me that they suffer from what I suffer from, but they've never talked to anybody about it. Just to go to an encourager today who are trained on either side and to say, you know what? I just need to tell somebody. I'm going through this. I need to tell somebody. He's taking a step. And every step that Peter took, he got closer and closer to Jesus. And look what happened. But when he saw the strong wind and waves, he was terrified and began to sink. I want to give you some encouragement that it's hard. What you're going through is so scary. What you're facing is so hard. When, when you have those moments where you don't want to get out of the bed, when no one else understands it and no one has compassion because they've never been through it. I'm telling you, I know what you're going through. And I know that even when you take that step of faith to go, I'm acknowledging what this is. I'm going to deal with it in the best way I know how. Peter still got afraid right out there in the midst. And he got so afraid that he began to sink. But I want you to see something. It was because of his trajectory, his 
destination was over here and the steps that he was taking, his decisions that he was making took him closer and closer to his de de the destiny that he needed to be at in Jesus. And because he was so close to God, Jesus reaches out his hand and he heals him. He reaches out his hand, he pulls him up. He reaches out his hand and he says, I've got you, man. You don't have to worry. Look, it says, save me, Lord, he shouted. And Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. Why could he reach out and grab him? Because Peter got close to Jesus. He got close to God. He didn't run from God in his moment of desperation. He didn't run from God thinking, I can't tell anybody about this. I can't go to small group anymore. They might make fun of me. I can't let anybody know this is going on. They'll think I'm weak. He stepped right out. And in his moment of desperation, he said, God, help me. I remember that moment for me. I was playing Uno with my kids. And they just are talking to me, just trying to have fun. And, and it starts to happen. And I remember crying out to in my soul, God, I have to be able to just play with my kids. This can't be the rest of my life, all right? Maybe you're taking away preaching. Maybe you're taking away my calling. And God stopped me in my tracks through a sermon that I was listening to said, stop questioning my calling in your life. I called you to do what I needed you to do, but you needed some stuff rubbed off of you. You needed to be made better. I wanted to show you what some people were going through in your congregation. I wanted you to have some compassion for people. Now get up out of the water, Peter. Let's walk back to the boat and calm the storm. And that's what he does. And I believe for some of you, this, this is your take courage moment. You're going to take courage and you're going to talk to somebody. You're going to take courage and you're going to make some appointments. You're going to take courage you're going to go no more. I don't stand behind Satan. I stand underneath the grace and the glory and the power of a God who can calm the waves. And then the last verse said, when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. And then they worshipped him and they said, this is God. When God shows up in your depression and your anxiety and the people around you know it's happening, you're going to be able to point to him and go, not by my might, not by my strength, but the strength of God is the only way I made it through this. You're going to point at him as you're walking going, hey, I could have done this without him. I can't make it another step without him because God expanded the boundaries of my faith. I stepped out into what he needed me to step out into. So here's what I'm calling you to today. This is your day. This is your day. You're going to take courage, and you're going to do it by expanding the boundaries. You're stepping out to the oceans, and it's scary, and they're lapping up around you, and you don't know what to do about it, and you don't know how to feel, and you don't even know how to describe what you're going through, but you're expanding your territory because you're saying, God, I will trust you. I will trust you. And during these moments, you maybe need to go to the cross and you'll repent of the sins of worry. I think a lot of people ought to be pinning to the cross today, repenting of worry. Maybe you need to go to the candles and just light a candle. But most of all, I don't want you to miss this. I want you to have a moment with God and say, expand the boundaries of my trust. Let the waves lap around my knees. I'll trust you. Let me sink to my chin. I'll trust you. If all I've got left coming out of the water is the tips of my fingers, I'll trust you because you're the God whose mighty hand reaches down and saves me and rips me out of sin's snare and rips me out of the depression and rips me out of the anxiousness. And so, God, I will reach for you with everything I have as we sing and respond. Would you make it a declaration of your heart? Expand my territory. Expand my territory, God of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.